Ham on Rye, Chapter 27 Wagner wasn't done with us. I was staying in the yard during gym class and walked up to me. What are you doing, Chinaski? Nothing. Nothing? I didn't answer. How come you're not in any of the games? Shit, that's kid stuff. I'm putting you on garbage detail until further notice. What for? What's the charge? Loitering. Fifty demerits. Kids had to work off their demerits in garbage detail. If you had more than ten demerits and didn't work them off, you couldn't graduate. I didn't care whether I graduated or not. That was their problem. You can stay around getting older and older and bigger and bigger. I get all the girls. Fifty demerits, I asked. Is that all you're going to give me? How about a hundred? Okay, one hundred. You got them. Wagner swaggered off. Peter Angler had five hundred demerits. Now I was in second place in gaining. First garbage detail was during the last 30 minutes of lunch. The next day I was carrying a garbage can with Peter Mangler. It was simple. We each had a stick with a sharp nail on the end of it. We picked up papers of the stick and stuck them into the can. The girls watched us as we walked by. They knew we were bad. Peter looked bored and I looked like I didn't give a damn. The girls knew we were bad. You know Willie Fishman? Pete asked as we walked along. Oh, yes, yes. Well, she's not a virgin. Well, how do you know? She told me. Who got her? Her father. Hmm. Well, you can't blame him. Lily has heard I've got a big cock. Yeah, it's all over school. Well, Lily wants it. She claims she can handle it. You'll rip her to pieces. Yeah, I will. Anyhow, she wants it. We put the garbage can down and stared some girls who were sitting on a bench. Pete walked toward the bench. I stood there. He walked up to one of the girls and whispered something in her ear. She started giggling. Pete walked back to the garbage can. We picked up and walked away. So, said Pete, this afternoon at 4 p.m., I'm going to rip Lily to pieces. Yeah? You hear that broken-down car at the back of the school that Pop Farmsworth took the engine out of? Yeah. Well, before they haul that son of a bitch away, that's going to be my bedroom. I'm going to take her in the back seat. Some guys really live. I'm getting a hard just thinking about it, said Pete. I am, too. I'm not even the guy who's going to do it. There's one problem, though, said Pete. You can't come? No, it's not that. I need a lookout. I need somebody to tell me the coast is clear. Yeah, well, look, uh, I can do that. Would you? asked Pete. Sure. We should have one more guy so we can watch in both directions. All right, who you got in mind? Baldy. Baldy? Shit, he's not much. No, but he's trustworthy. Alright, so I'll see you guys at 4. We'll be there. At 4 p.m., we met Pete and Lily at the car. Hi, said Lily. She looked hot. Pete was smoking a cigarette. He looked bored. Hello, Lily, I said. Hi, Lily, baby, said Baldy. There were some guys playing a game of touch football in the other field, but that only made it better. A kind of camouflage. Lily was wiggling around, breathing heavily, her breasts were moving up and down. Well, said Pete, throwing a cigarette away. Let's make friends, Lily. He opened the back door, bowed, and Lily climbed in. Pete got in after him, took his shoes off, and then his pants and his shorts. Lily looked down and saw Pete's meat hanging. Oh my, she said. I didn't, I don't know. Come on, baby, said Pete. Nobody lives forever. Well, all right, I guess. Pete looked out the window. Hey, are you guys watching to see if the coast is clear? Yeah, Pete, I said. We're watching. We're looking, said Baldy. Pete pulled Lily's skirt all the way up. There was white flesh above her knee socks so you could see her panties. Glorious. Pete grabbed Lily and kissed her, and then he pulled away. You whore, he said. Talk nice to me, bit to be Pete. You bitch whore, he said, and slapped her across the face. Hard. She began sobbing. Don't, Pete, don't. Shut up, cunt. Pete began pulling at Lily's panties. He was having a terrible time. Her, her panties were tight around her big ass. Pete gave a violent tug that ripped and he pulled the panties down around her legs and off over her shoes. He threw them on the floorboard. Then he began playing with her cunt. He played with her cunt and played with her cunt and kissed her again and again. Then he leaned back against the car seat. He only had half a heart. We looked down at him. What are you, a queer? No, it's not that, Lily. It's just I don't think these guys are watching to see if the coast is clear. They're watching us. I don't want to get it caught in here. The coast is clear, Pete, I said. We're watching. We're watching, said Baldy. I don't believe them, said Pete. All they're watching is your cunt, Lily. Your chicken. All that meat and it's only at half mast. I'm scared of getting caught, Lily. I know what to do, she said. Lily bent over and ran her tongue along Pete's cock. She lapped her tongue around the monster's head. Then she had her mouth. Lily, Christ, said Pete. I love you. Lily, Lily. Oh, oh, oh. Henry, Baldy screamed. Look. I looked. It was Wagner running towards us from across the field, and also coming behind him were the guys who had been playing touch football, plus some of the people who had been watching the football game, boys and girls both. Pete, I yelled. It's Wagner, coming with 50 people. Shit, moaned Pete. Oh, shit, said Lily. Baldy and I took off. We ran out the gate and halfway up the block. We looked back through the fence. The Pete and Lily never had a chance. Wagner ran up and ripped open the car door, hoping for a good luck. Then the car was surrounded we couldn't see anymore. After that, we never saw Peter or Lily again. We had no idea what happened to them. Baldy and I each got 1,000 demerits, which put me in the lead of Mangalore with 1,100. There was no way I could work them off. I was in Mount Justin for life. Of course, they informed her parents. Let's go, said my father, and I walked in the bathroom. He got the strap down. Take down your pants and shorts, he said. 
I didn't do it. He reached in front of me, yanked my belt open, unbuttoned me, he yanked my pants down. He pulled down my shorts. The strap landed. It was the same, the same explosive sound, the same pain. You're going to kill your mother, he screamed. He hit me again, but the tears weren't coming. My eyes were strangely dry. I thought about killing him, that there must be a way to kill him. In a couple of years, I could beat him to death, but I wanted him now. He wasn't much of anything. I must have been adopted. He hit me again. The pain was still there, but the fear of it was gone. The strap landed again. The room no longer blurred. I could see everything clearly. My father seemed to sense the difference in me, and he began to lash me harder, again and again, but the more he beat me, the less I felt. It was almost as if he was the one who was helpless. Something had occurred. Something had changed. My father stopped, puffing, and I heard him hanging up the strap. He walked to the door. I turned. Hey, I said. Father turned and looked at me. Give me a couple more, I told him, if it makes you feel any better. Don't you dare talk to me that way, he said. I looked at him. I saw folds of flesh under his chin and around his neck. I saw sad wrinkles and crevices. His face was tire pink putty. He was in his undershirt, and his belly sagged, wrinkling his undershirt. The eyes were no longer fierce. His eyes looked away and couldn't meet mine. Something had happened. The bath towels knew it. The shower curtain knew it. The mirror knew it. The bathtub and the toilet knew it. My father turned and walked out the door. He knew it. It was my last beating. From him.